So what are glo global value chains? You, I'm, I'm sure you all hear this uh, term all the time these days, and it may sound very boring and technocratic. Think of it as being the new face of international trade. So at the World Bank, uh, Every year we prepare one report, one flagship report, that's called the World Development Report. We choose one issue and we cover this issue in great depth. Um, a year and a half ago we decided to write about international trade and global value chains are the new phase of international trade. So you can, you can uh, take this as uh, our thinking on the role that international trade plays these days in development. Uh, when we started working on this topic, we approached it from the beginning from the point of view of developing countries. So our interest, international trade has been important for all countries, but especially for the smaller countries. And by smaller here, I mean in terms of economic size. Um, we live at a time when things are changing very fast. There, there are new technologies in, in the horizon. There is automation. There is machine learning. Uh, there is also a rise in protectionism, um, especially in the U.S., but I would say more generally in advanced countries. And against this background, uh, the question we wanted to ask, um, we in the World Bank, would we be still comfortable saying to developing countries, saying to countries like Kenya, you should do everything you can to embrace international trade and, um, and to be more open and more connected to the rest of the world. So is that a message that's still relevant today in this new world that we live, or has this message become outdated? So, so this was our thinking. And as I said, we approached this question from the beginning from the point of view of developing countries. So uh, the answer, very briefly, is, um, as I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, the, uh, there is a lot of evidence that global value chains, based on historical experience, have boosted incomes. Uh, they, ha they have created better jobs. They have reduced poverty in many developing countries, especially in East Asia. So they have done many good things. Uh, not Everything is rosy, so they had, they've had mixed impact on the environment, they've, they've had mixed impact on inequality. In many cases, we show that they actually led to an increase in inequality. Uh, however, our view at the end is that they can continue to support development um, if developing countries do their part, which is undertake deep reforms, not uh, just superficial reforms, and on the other hand, industrial countries, so countries like the United States, countries in the European Union, uh, pursue open and predictable policies. So, and, and the latter is very important these days. So um, with this very short introduction, let me, uh, l l let me get to the substance of the talk and start by defining what global value chains are. So, so what, are, what, what exactly are global value chains? So, um, in the old days, when people thought about international trade, they thought about one country producing a product, let's say a car, and then exporting it to another country. So this was direct trade from one country to another. What happens in global value chains is you take a product, let's say a car, you break it into parts and components, and then you trade parts and components back and forth between countries. So in that sense, you have even if you, if you trade one product like a car, you end up with much more trade because you trade parts and components. This doesn't apply only to cars. So almost every product and every service can be traded this way these days. So, and accordingly, uh, to use some terminology, we, in some cases, we talk about forward participation. So there are some countries, and many developing countries fall into this category, they, they produce um, uh, uh, raw materials or agricultural products, um, cotton, for example. They um, produce it, then they export it to another country. Then this recipient country takes this product, let's say it takes cotton, it processes it, it processes it, it produces something else, cloth. Then it takes this cloth and it exports it to a different country. Okay, so it's not a final product that, that goes directly to the consumer. It's an intermediate product that goes to another firm. Um, so this firm exports it, or this country exports it to another country, and this other country, this, this final recipient, processes it further. It may produce textiles or clothing, 
and sells it to the final consumers. In some cases, it may export it back to the original country. Okay, so in that case, you start with cotton. Cotton becomes cloth. Cloth becomes a different type of cloth. And these products get traded back and forth. Same thing with cars. That, that's the, the classic example that people always give when it comes to global value chains. So you start with uh, steel or uh, rubber. You, you export these raw materials. Then they get processed. You produce some parts parts, some intermediate parts, maybe engines, maybe brakes, then you may export them to another country, um, assemble them there, and uh, eventually you produce the final product, the car, and you export it to another country. Okay, so this is the nature of global value chain. Uh, so value chain in general means it includes all steps that the business takes to, to produce a product or a service and bring it to the consumer. And we, we use the word global to make clear that in this age of globalization that we live, these value chains uh, cross borders. So these firms that trade products and uh, parts and components back and forth are located in many different countries. Okay? So now, why is this important? Why do we think global value chains are important for international trade? So, so there are two features that make them very special in international trade, and both are important for developing countries. So the first one is that you have a lot of fragmentation. So take again the example that I gave you uh, for a car. You, you trade parts and components back and forth. And what this means for a developing country is that in principle it makes it, it may make it easier for a country to participate in trade. Um, take the example of Mexico. So Mexico is a country that has participated very successfully in uh, the production and um, in the automobile industry. Uh, for a country like Mexico, it might have been very difficult to produce a, a, a car, the final product we call a car. Why? Because once upon a time, it didn't have the capabilities to do that. It didn't have the technical know-how. It didn't have the capital. It didn't have the machinery. It didn't have the skilled labor that was needed to produce a car. But it was much easier for Mexico to participate by producing parts and components that didn't require the full range of capabilities. So from that point of view, it makes it easier for a developing country to participate in trade. So that's the first reason. There is a second reason which actually is even more important for developing countries. And this is that what happens in global value chains, or in value chains in general, they, they are, as we say, relational in nature. So they don't happen in anonymous markets uh, where firms trade back and forth without knowing anything about each other. So with global value chains, you have relationships between firms, relationships that persist over long periods of time. Um, and what this means is it, it allows firms to engage much more um, uh, successfully in knowledge transfer, in technology transfer. And because of that, it allows firms to also raise their productivity uh, uh, much more than it, it might have been the case with, with traditional trade. Um, if you read the report, I don't have time to, to go over it in detail, but we cover, one example we cover is the the uh, flower industry in Kenya, which is a, a successful example, a successful case of, of uh, global value chain participation uh, for Kenya. And this is a case where trade is very much based on relationships. Um, uh, very briefly, I, I, I told you I'm not, I don't have the time to cover this, but, but one, one advantage of these relationships in the context of Kenya is uh, we often hear from many that that uh, one problem with uh, developing countries in many cases is you don't have stability. You, you have uh, policies are not predictable. You have uh, things changing very, very fast. In the worst case, uh, you may have violence, you, have, you may have conflict, and uh, this stands in the way of trade and growth. Well, in, in such an environment, it might be very hard to write contracts that you can enforce. Uh, relationships help alleviate this, prog this problem. So relationships in many case, in many cases, may be a substitute for good institutions. Not that good institutions are not, not important and we should always push for good institutions, but in cases where you don't have them and you don't know where to start, these relationships may help. So for all these reasons, uh, these relationships, these global value chains that are based on relationships can actually foster development. So this is what makes them special. So starting with this, we, you know, with this thinking, 
the questions we asked in this report, we started with outcomes. And, and what we looked at was the question of whether global value chains are associated with better outcomes. Because if the outcomes are not good, there is no point of pushing for them. So the first question we asked was, um, do we have evidence uh, that global value chains contributed to development? And um, the answer is, uh, uh, you know, I'm, 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 my background is an academic one. I'm an academic economist. Uh, uh, I was an academic economist before joining the World Bank. So in academia, we tend to be very nuanced. Everything has pros and cons. And, uh, you know, we're very hesitant to say with confidence this, this is good and this is bad. But when it comes to the effects of global value chains on growth and development, uh, the, the answer is that uh, they unambiguously had very big effects on growth and development for developing countries. And I, I'll show you why. Uh, I'll show you why in a moment. Before I get there, I want to make one more point. And this is, uh, many people ask, um, which are the countries that participate the most in global value chains? Um, and why is it that some countries participate and some others not? One point we actually emphasize in our work is that if you look at the maps, if you look at the data, it turns out that all countries in the world participate. But they participate in different ways and they participate to, to a different extent. So the question is not simply whether or not you participate. So Kenya participates, Ethiopia participates, every, almost every country in the world participate, participates. But the question is how you participate um, and how, how large is your participation. So let me show you, you know, in, 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 in a map and using colors what the map of participation is. So in shades of orange, you can see countries that participate through uh, trade in commodities or raw materials. So these are countries that, for the most part, export materials to other countries. And, um, you know, when the, the colors get darker, it means they participate uh, more, intense, more, inten more intensely. So many developing countries uh, tend to participate in trade by exporting raw materials and commodities. Uh, many of these countries are in Africa. Many of these countries are in Latin America. Uh, then in the shades of blue, you see the countries that participate in manufacturing. Um, again, light blue means low participation. Darker blue is more participation. Actually, here the, the dark blue denotes uh, advanced manufacturing. So light blue is limited manufacturing. Limited manu manufacturing means you produce products like textiles, footwear, uh, agribusiness as well. Uh, dark blue means you, you produce and you export or you participate in trade of cars, of machinery, of more advanced products. And then you have the countries that participate in innovative activities, in services, in activities that are very research uh, intensive. So if you look at this map as a whole, you can see that the entire world has some degree of participation. But countries participate in, in different ways uh, by um, engaging in different activities. And that actually matters for the outcomes. I'm sure at this point you're wondering where Kenya is. So Kenya is in light blue here. And uh, it participates in, um, in, in global value chains through limited manufacturing. Uh, mostly through agribusiness. So I'll come back to that because it turns out this is really important. But for Kenya, it's agribusiness that, dri that drives the, the participation. So what are the good effects that I talked about? So first, uh, uh, it turns out that firms that engage in this global value chain trade are more productive. They are, they're more productive for the reason I explained before, that because you have these relationships, you have much uh, more extensive knowledge transfer, technology transfer, and that benefits recipient countries. And one way you see it, so you can see data from, from Ethiopia. I didn't have the data from Kenya, but there are data from Ethiopia. So firms that both export and import um, tend to have higher productivity than firms that just export or just import. So again, to drive home the point, it's not just trade that's good. What's good here is that you both import and export. And perhaps one takeaway from all this is these days many countries and many policy makers, including in the United States, are fixated on, on a mercantilist point of view that exports are good, imports are bad. One important message of this, word, of this work is that imports also have beneficial effects because imports facilitate, in many cases, technology transfer. So especially for developing countries, imports may play a very important role in productivity growth. 
Um, now, one, one uh, natural response to this is, yes, you have these firms, they're more productive, they're also more capital intensive, they use more capital, they use more machines, but what this means is these firms may generate fewer jobs. And uh, one, one issue that we care about a lot in developing countries is whether or not firms generate jobs, and by jobs I mean good jobs in the formal economy, uh, jobs with benefits that, that give people security. Uh, the answer is uh, uh, these firms that are more productive and more capital intensive are also associated with employment growth. So again, you can see it here, firms that both import and export tend to generate more jobs. How can that be? There is a scale effect. So the firms that use more capital and more productive are firms that do well, they grow, and this size effect means they can hire more people. So yes, they, they might have hired even more people if they didn't use machines, but then they might have not been as productive. So um, we find very strong effects on employment and also growth. What this means is, in the end, that all this translates to, to poverty reduction, and the most dramatic case is the case of Vietnam, so I'll show you this picture. Um, Vietnam is an incredible success story, it participated through, through limited manufacturing, so textiles uh, mainly, but also, also agriculture to a certain extent. And what you see in this map, you can use regional variation in Vietnam to identify these effects. So these areas here in dark blue are the um, areas in which you have more firms participating in trade, in, in global value chain trade. And on the, in green, you see the areas that experience the largest poverty reduction in Vietnam. And you can see that it's precisely those areas where you had more GVC trade, where you had more uh, international trade activity. These are exactly the areas that also experience the fastest poverty reduction. The country as a whole experienced, experienced very rapid poverty reduction for many reasons, not just trade. There were also other policies that contributed. But the point of this graph is to show you that the trade um, played also a very important part, and especially trade within global value chains. Um, now, th this is my favorite graph in the whole report. Um, and uh, th this is the graph that, that makes it very clear that, that uh, global value chains have big effects on per capita income growth. So what this shows is what the cumulative effects of joining a global value chain are. 20 years after a country joins, depending on, on whether this country joins through, through limited manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, or innovative activities. So, so let me spend some time on this graph um, to, to explain exactly what is going on. So first, one, uh, one thing you may have noticed is that agriculture is not here or raw commodities, so countries that participate just by exporting uh, commodities or raw materials, we don't have any evidence that they grow very fast. And this is unfortunately very much consistent with the experience many developing countries have had, especially resource-rich countries in Africa, they may export, um, they may have high exports, uh, but this, this, these exports don't tra translate to growth, uh, they certainly don't translate to per capita income growth. So agriculture is not here, raw commodities are not here, oil exports are not here. Um, countries that participate through limited manufacturing, again, these are textiles um, uh, for the most part, uh, footwear, and so on. These are the countries that grow the fastest. So from the time they join to, 20 to 25 years later, they have grown uh, by 57%. So per capita, that is all per capita. So per capita income growth is cumulatively 57%. So essentially this is the story of East Asia here. So this is the story of Vietnam and Korea, and before that, Japan in the early days, and, and, and China. Then countries that are here in the blue, so these are the countries that participate through, let's say, automobiles or uh, machines and so on. Um, so these countries also grow, so you still see growth, but it's lower. The cumulative growth is 48%. And frankly, here with purple, you have countries that, that uh, participate through innovative activities. Um, so these are these research, research intensive uh, uh, activities. So most advanced countries are here and still you see growth, uh, about 32%, but it's lower. This is exactly what you would expect because countries that are here tend to be richer to start with. And if you are richer, you, you naturally, uh, it, it becomes harder to grow 
countries who are here in the light green, these are the countries that have the most to gain, and these countries grow very fast. Another thing to keep in mind in this graph is that most, many countries are in all three parts of the graph because they transition from one part to another. So for example, Korea is a very interesting case, or Japan. So Korea started through limited manufacturing, you know, by exporting uh, textiles, footwear, and then it moved to advanced manufacturing, cars, and now it's here, innovative activities. Many countries in Europe also fit this pattern. They start here, and then they move to the blue, and then they move to the purple. Okay? So um, as I said, this is a graph that sends a very strong message, namely that global value chains uh, do participate, uh, in, do generate this, this very rapid, this, this incredibly rapid growth. Now, one, one uh, question that people often ask us, and I think this is particularly relevant for developing countries, and especially for countries uh, like Kenya, is I said before that we, you have countries that transition from one part to another. Um, and countries in general want that because that means higher incomes for them. So, so when you are here, that these are countries that have very low wages. Eventually, these countries want to raise the standard of living. They want workers to get better wages, better living conditions. So most countries want this transition. One question that people often ask us is, do we see leapfrogging? So can countries skip one stage? So can you start, for example, with limited manufacturing and then move all the way to services and innovation and research? Or can you start with agriculture and never go through limited manufacturing or advanced manufacturing and go straight to services? And often this is a dream that's sold to, to, to developing countries these days. I will just say that we don't have a single case of, of a single country in our data that has managed to achieve that. The, the difference across countries is that some countries spend very little time in one stage or another. So for example, Korea is a success case. Korea spent very, spent very little time on limited manufacturing and then transitioned very fast to high value added activities, so activities that generate very higher per capita income, but we don't see any leapfrogging in our data. And of course, this is all backward looking. So, so this is based on historical experience. It doesn't mean it's, uh, it's, it's uh, impossible in the future, but, but again, it makes it less likely when we have never witnessed it in the past. One natural question is, so how does Kenya fare uh, in this picture? And I'm afraid that I don't have a very, um, a very optimistic message here. So uh, Kenya has increased in, in its participation in global value chain. Uh, so if you look at the, at, this is the purple line here in my graph, you can see that over the last uh, uh, 20 years, it has been uh, steadily increasing its participation in global value chains, but it's still lower compared to what the global average is. Uh, the same, by the way, applies to Ethiopia. Now, uh, Kenya participates, as I said earlier, through limited manufacturing. Uh, so I, I told you before that limited manufacturing in our previous picture is associated with this very high growth in per capita incomes. If you look at what happened uh, in Kenya, and also I put here Ethiopia in this graph as well because it's a, it's a nice contrast, it's a nice comparison. Uh, and Ethiopia is also mentioned often as, as a, su a success case, a country that's growing very fast. But in both cases, if you see what's happening, is the growth in both countries is substantially lower than the growth that countries, developing countries, have experienced in the past. So in other words, we don't see in Kenya or Ethiopia what we saw in East Asia. So uh, this is the, another way to show the, the graph I showed you before. After 25 years, you, you have cumulative growth of 57%. But you, know, you see growth after five years, after 10 years, after 15 years, after 20 years. So this is the global average. And this is the average here for uh, Ethiopia. And this, is the, uh, this is what's happening here with Kenya. So after 10 years of participation in limited manufacturing, you have only 4% per capita income growth in Kenya. Here, this is 4% that you can attribute to global value chains alone. So it's, it's substantially lower. So what is going on here and how is this compatible with what I told you before? What drives this is uh, mainly the fact that in Kenya, you, you, you don't have much manufacturing. The, the participation through, through pure manufacturing, uh, textiles and so on, is very low. It's all agribusiness. And so agribusiness does not generate this big uh, growth effects that we see in manufacturing. Uh, 
And the reason for that is there is a literature that, that's mostly based on, on data from Latin America and Europe, looking at, at the supermarket revolution in these countries. And what this literature has shown is that in many cases, agribusiness is the result of development. It's not the driver of development. What I mean by that is in many, of, in many countries, Incomes start to grow. There is a middle class. The middle class wants more food. They want more diversity. They want uh, more food diversity. They want better quality, more variety. And that generates demand for uh, food, for agricultural products. Then, uh, as a result, you, you get an intermediary sector, so a sector that is between farmers and between consumers. And this, this sector consists of uh, distributors and marketers and so on. So this is the agribusiness, right? And agribusiness can generate high incomes, but you need the middle class first in order to generate these incomes. So, so uh, th this is one of the reasons uh, I think that we don't see this fast development in Kenya or Ethiopia that we see in other countries. So I will skip that. So this doesn't mean necessarily that, that it's too late uh, you know, for Africa to, to, um, to, to, to reap the gains from global value chains and trade. But again, our research so far suggests that perhaps manufacturing and industrializations are still important stages. So we don't have any evidence that without those countries can advance very fast, or, or to qualify what I just said, maybe it is possible, but not at the pace that East Asia achieves such growth. Maybe uh, countries need to, to, to take it slower if they want to grow through, through agribusiness or services. And another question was, I, I started by saying, so, so to summarize so far, the, the answer is globally, you know, based on, on other countries, we see that global value chains have had these very fast effects on per capita income growth. We haven't seen these effects in Africa yet, and certainly not in Kenya or Ethiopia, and, and uh, this is partly because they don't participate through manufacturing. But then one, and so perhaps this is one way they can um, engage more fully in global trade in the future. But then the, there are two challenges that they face. Uh, one of the challenges is automation, and the other challenge is the rise of protectionism. And briefly, we don't find any evidence that automation is eliminating jobs. This was one of the big surprises uh, in our work. Um, uh, I'll show you, you know, this graph here industries that employ more robots, so cars, the automo automobile industry, this is the classic example, it turns out that industries that use a lot of robots are also industries that have increased their trade with developing countries. And the reason for that is as these countries expand, again, there is a scale effect. Industries that use, firms that use more robots, uh, are firms that, that do well, they become more productive, they expand, and as they expand, they need more parts, they need more components, they need more intermediate products. They still import these intermediate products from developing countries. So what we actually found is that automation and robots are good news for developing countries. They may be bad news for advanced countries. They may be replacing workers and people in advanced countries, and there is a huge debate <laughs> about these issues in advanced countries, but they still generate trade with developing countries because they still need to import parts and components from developing countries. So, so far we don't find any evidence evidence that automation has, uh, is eliminating trade with developing countries. What is perhaps a bigger challenge, a much bigger challenge for developing countries is the rise of protectionism in advanced countries. And, and there, I have to say, the ball is in the court of, of, um, of, uh, of advanced countries. Um, I, I want to say a, a few words, uh, I don't have much time, but I want to say a few words about the costs of GVC participation. So, so far I've told you uh, good things about global value chains, all the good things that global value chains uh, do. Uh, th there is also another side that we have to be aware of in many developing countries, policymakers and the public as well prioritize growth and per capita. Uh, income growth, uh, this is natural. The first priority, the, the main priority is to lift people out of poverty. But at the same time, we should not lose sight of the fact that ultimately the goal is not to raise income, is to, to achieve better living standards. And with that in mind, we ask the question, so wh what, are, what are the effects of global value chains on various measures of inequality? One pretty uh, striking finding is that global value chains 
lead to a rising profits of firms of as we call them, lead firms in advanced countries, they actually lead to a decline in profit margins in uh, developing countries. So this graph, it will show you, it, it tells the, the full picture. Uh, this graph compares markups, so profits, in the textile industry in two countries, Japan, which is an advanced country, and India, which is a developing country. Both countries have very high participation in the textile industry, but in many, in different ways. So what you see is the blue line shows what happens to profit, to profit margins, markups as we call them. In Japan, uh, the profit margins uh, rise over time. In India, the profit margins decline over time. This is not specific to these countries. We find this for literally all countries in our sample. And uh, intuitively what's going on here is if you think about how Japan participates, uh, Japan imports cheap cloth or cheap cotton from developing countries. It processes it, then it produces more advanced uh, products and then exports those. Um, because of global value chains, because of globalization, countries like Japan can source these inputs from the cheapest country, from the cheapest developing country. So the cost becomes very low because of globalization. They don't necessarily pass this cost through to consumers, so as a result, their profit margins increase. So that's the story for these countries. On the other hand, the countries that sell the inputs, they, they cannot take advantage of this mechanism. So actually, these countries um, sell their inputs in many cases at, at, at lower prices. That here, the story is one of monopsony. So we don't see... Um, we don't see countries, uh, countries, uh, firms in developing countries uh, uh, raising their profits. Uh, th this is this is a big issue these days that's debated very uh, very extensively in uh, in uh, advanced countries. What about uh, the effects on women? Uh, the effects on women are also mixed in many countries. Uh, global value chains and more generally trade and manufacturing have led to more jobs for women, more formal, more jobs in the formal sector. This is the good news. On the other hand, they have not allowed women to break the glass ceiling. So uh, there is a lot of evidence uh, uh, from many developing countries. Vietnam is a very interesting case because Vietnam has the highest female labor force participation. So this is a case where because of trade, because of global value chain chains. Uh, it was possible to integrate women in the labor force, but then you find that most women are employed as production workers, not administrative, administrative workers. Production workers tend to have lower wages, and also we don't see many women to own businesses or uh, hold managerial positions. Uh, taxes are a, 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 a very important issue. Um, and again, developing countries are on the losing end. Why are taxes an important issue? Because one of the implications of global value chains is because this because big firms uh, are, are, are active globally, it becomes possible, it becomes easier for them to shift profits across locations. That means countries lose tax revenue. Um, and all countries lose, in, in terms of absolute amounts, it's actually the, the more advanced countries, it's the OECD countries that lose the most, uh, simply because there is more economic activity there. But if you ask the question, how much do countries lose as percentage of GDP, then it's the non-OECD countries that lose the most. Okay, so. So uh, th this is an important issue that we flag in the report. It's not one issue that, that it's easy to remedy, but it's an issue, an issue that really takes international multilateral cooperation to fully address. And uh, finally, there are also mixed effects on the environment. And um, uh, what I mean by that is if you think what global value chains do is you break up the product and then you start trading parts back and forth. So that means uh, more transport, more carbon emissions, uh, more packaging, uh, more, uh, more waste. Uh, on the positive side, uh, I have to say, we didn't find any evidence of pollution havens. So there has always been this allegation that firms in developed countries export pollution. They take pollution intensive activities and they ship them off to developing countries. Actually, we do not have, find any evidence of, of doing, or, or firms actually doing this. Um, however, we do find evidence of, of additional uh, uh, costs on the environment because of waste and transport. There are also some good effects in the sense that uh, many firms in advanced countries these days 
push for higher environmental standards um, and also for higher labor standards in developing countries. And from the point of view of developing countries, this, this is a mixed blessing because sometimes it's impossible to miss, this, to miss these standards. And sometimes this advanced country perspective means it, it becomes much more expensive for a developing country, for a country like Kenya, to, to meet the standards and successfully participate. On the other hand, uh, it, it may in the long run, it, have, it may have beneficial effects on everyone because better environment and cleaner environment is associated with a higher quality of life. Um, the report contains main, many recommendations about what countries can do to successfully participate. And uh, uh, let me just say a few words about Africa, uh, uh, Kenya in particular. So, oops. so what are the reasons that uh, that um, we see low participation in Kenya, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so here are some of, some of the issues we flag in the report. Uh, labor costs are very high in Kenya relative, uh, relative to other developing countries. I will, show, I will show a picture to you in a moment, but they're also very high relative to GDP. Um, connectivity and infrastructure are important issues. You cannot, you cannot engage in trade unless you can transport, you can move goods across space. Uh, there have been some studies that have found that in Ethiopia and also in Nigeria, the effect of distance on trade is four times as large as in um, a country like the United States. Uh, restrictive trade and investment policies remain, so there has been uh, a lot of progress made uh, here in Africa, but we still see very high tariffs on imports of intermediate uh, products, uh, low FDI and uh, FDI linkages. Services are still restricted, and um, service trade has always been restricted, even in areas that are very integrated, like the European Union, but they are particularly restricted here. And they're also restricted in important sectors like logistics, distribution, um, education, professional services. Logistics and distribution are particularly important because they also affect the, the distribution of, of products you trade. Um, and finally, there is also low adoption of international quality um, and international standards. As I mentioned earlier, we are at a time when many consumers in advanced countries are pushing for higher standards. Many firms are pushing. Uh, <coughs> the reason for that is that pe people, especially in Europe, have become increasingly aware of challenges such as climate change. Uh, consumers care where the product came from. Um, under which conditions was it produced, uh, were there labor standards, were there environmental standards followed or not, and if not, they often boycott the product. And as a result, firms st have started to respond to this sentiment. Uh, in many cases, firms, when they are active in developing countries, they demand that these standards are met. And as I mentioned earlier, this makes it more expensive to produce, but ultimately it may be an, an opportunity for developing countries. Uh, this is the picture I want to show you about, Ethiopia, about um, Kenya and Ethiopia. So this, this, this is an estimate of the labor costs in various developing countries. And uh, uh, this is Kenya here. So this, these are labor costs relative to GDP. So as you can tell, they are very high relative to Ethiopia, but also relative to, to a country like Bangladesh. Bangladesh is another success case for global value chain participation, especially in, tech, in, in garments. And, and the point here is not just that it's high, but or, or it's also high relative to GDP. So if you compare this to Bangladesh, this is a case where, where, where Kenya is really at a disadvantage. And, and the, Part of the reason for that is labor regulation, and this is not to say that labor regulation is not uh, beneficial, but, but, but one should, should try to avoid excessive labor regulation. I just want to, to uh, make two, uh, two final points in, in conclusion. Um, uh, our overall message in, in that report is, uh, so far, the historical experience suggests that participation in trade, in international trade, and especially through global value chains, has had important growth effects, important developing effect, development effects on, uh, on developing countries. Um, these effects have mostly come from participation in manufacturing, uh, not agriculture, not, not agribusiness so far. Um, 
the, not everything is rosy. Global value chains also increase inequality. They have mixed effects on the welfare of women. They have mixed effects on the environment. So these are effects that also need to be addressed. But on net, you know, on balance, uh, it, it seems that if a country wants to grow, if a especially if a country is a country of, of smaller economic size, if this country wants to grow fast, it's in, it, it's in its interest to be still internationally integrated and try to successfully participate. This has become increasingly challenging, not because of what developing countries do or have done, but mainly because of the sentiment in advanced countries. Uh, th there is a rise in protectionism, and at the same time, the shift in focus in many advanced countries to issues such as climate change. Um, inequality means there is, there is less concern about poverty and there is perhaps less of an appetite for trading with developing countries. So in my view, that's the biggest challenge that developing countries may face today. But that said, there is still a lot of room, a lot of, a lot of uh, maneuver room that allows developing countries to, 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 to still grow, perhaps not at the pace that we've seen in the past decade, so this may be uh, unrealistic, but there is still room to grow at, at a healthier, perhaps at a slower pace. And for this to happen, all countries need to do their part. To be absolutely clear, the report was not targeted just uh, to developing countries. The report was equally targeted uh, towards uh, advanced countries when we point out that uh, advanced countries need to to abandon protectionist policies, they need to uh, they need to embrace multilateralism. They need to embrace open policies, predictable policies. They need to address issues such as taxation that uh, allows that the current system allows firms to evade taxation in many countries. So there are many messages for advanced countries, but there are also messages for developing countries. And uh, in many cases, these these tend to be country specific. Uh, the, the the right policies to adopt are going to depend from country to country. But the general message is that um, uh, by embracing trade uh, and open policies, developing countries can still grow. And so uh, that's ultimately the message of this report. So I will stop here. I, I'm afraid I already uh, spoke for very long. And I will be more than happy to take questions.